the years go quickly. Uh, a moment ago, Molly was on stage, and I remember Jeff waiting for college, and Lou was my cable foot, and I remember Claire's long stride on the cross country course. Um, and everyone, we all have images of our students, and they, of course, have the same of us. Uh, I've always said that our role is to just be doing the same thing when they come back, and we plug right in. Lou, uh, Lou Cirillo noticed in the dining room, he was just counting the same teachers who were in the same place. I like that. It's good. In any case, I know a number of you are, uh, weren't in school meetings, so I'm going to mention, I'm going to talk a little about their backgrounds overall, but they're going to throw their, uh, they'll be explaining a lot more. Claire McConnell, class of 05, is a quantitative researcher in computer program living in Philadelphia, a four-year rower at Blair, and at Dartmouth College, she won the gold in the women's lightweight four at the head of the Charles with her club team in 2011. She'll be talking about her experiences in the field of finance and offer Blair Rowe's advice on pursuing the sport after graduation. Um, there's a long write-up for Lucerillo, but he's created a company called Virtual U, and I think he's going to show some of this on the screen. I'll say no more. And Jeff, of course, you just met in the dining room. He's an investment banking analyst at City Group in New York City. And he's enjoying the big city out uh, here, uh, living in the Hell's Kitchen area. Uh, he went to Brown, and we'll tell you a little about his experiences. Molly, you heard her very good voice in the dining room. Uh, the word is, if you ask her, she might even belt out a tune or two. Not a one tune. Uh, she's a singer and actor. And we'll talk about the challenges living in, uh, of live performances and advancing in a, in a very competitive industry. Uh, she happens to be a 2009 graduate of NYU. We're going to start uh, with Claire. Each, each of our guests will speak briefly, relatively briefly. And at the end, we'll pass the mic around and answer any and all questions. Uh, not easy to get four people together in their, from their busy lives. Uh, and it's wonderful to have them back on campus. Let's welcome these people. You might want to. Hi. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my experience with Blair and then how I got to where I am today. Um, so I started at Blair as a sophomore, actually, um, and I, I was really interested in math and science, so I really pursued those here, and while I was here, I was also on the rowing team um, and the ski team, and I did a season of cross country, too. Um, so I think the three years I spent at Blair were a huge transitional phase in my life, and um, kind of imprinted a lot of fundamental values in my personality. Um, you know, I think that, uh, that Blair kind of forces you to balance a lot of different things, and, um, and, and, and that's something that I sort of carried through uh, through my life, learning to, to, to handle a million different, you know, you know between sports and classes, um, learning to manage all that. Uh, it's a pretty valuable skill, and I think um, you definitely get that here. So, when I graduated from Blair, I went off to Dartmouth. Um, and when I got to Dartmouth, I didn't think I was going to row. I really wanted to be an engineer, and so I thought I'll just focus all my energy on engineering classes and forget rowing. Um, but somehow I got on the email distribution list, and I, and I felt obligated to come to a practice or two, and, and I was hooked. Um, so I rowed for four years there, and I have to say it really defined my college experience. Um, you know, some of my best memories from college were spending with the team, um, winning sprints our freshman year, which is a big, um, big race for all the Eastern schools, and going to NCAA my senior year. So um, it was definitely a great thing for me in college. Um, and when I graduated from Dartmouth, I applied to a bunch of jobs, and it was a, I graduated in 2009, and it was a really tough economy. So I got one job offer. Um, and it was at a company called Turner Investments, um, and they are a fundamental investing company. Uh, they take big institutions' money and invest it in the stock market using fundamental analysis, mainly. Um, they have a small 
quantitative research team, which is where I worked. Um, and they um, manage a little bit of their own money, but the main function is to support these fundamental analysts with quantitative research. So quantitative investing is using computer models to buy and sell stocks versus actually researching the companies. Um, so uh, I had this two week break between when I graduated and when I started at Turner. I decided to go down to Boathouse Row in Philadelphia and, and like try out sculling just for fun. You know, when I graduated, I didn't think I was going to keep growing. I thought I'll just, you know, tackle my job full force. Um, but I, uh, I, I tried out sculling, which is a different kind of rowing, and I loved it. So I, I joined a, a boat club in Philadelphia, and um, and I, I've been competing with their elite racing team for the past three years. Um, so that involves training, you know, five, four or five hours a day, um, and we compete at uh, World Trials, um, Pan American Trials, Head of the Charles, which is a big fall race, national championships. So I got to compete at a lot of um, big rowing races, which was a lot of fun. Um, and then, while I was training uh, those three years, I worked full time for about a year, and then I decided I wanted to. I really liked quantitative finance, and I wanted to step it up a level. So I enrolled in a master's program at Penn in computer science, um, and then uh, finished that. And I finished that in about a year and a half. And when I graduated, when I finished my master's program at Penn, I I got a different job at a company called AJO, which is where I work now. And they do only quantitative investing, so it's really more um, what I was interested in. Um, uh, so I was pretty excited about that. Uh, so I started there last March, and um, I, I was still training for the most for, um, for the first you know six months or so, and then it started to feel like I, you know I really loved this job. It was kind of a new passion for me, and, and, and rowing is such a big time commitment. So it's starting to feel like a burden and. Um, so I decided to retire from competitive rowing after um, World's Trials last summer. So now I, I spend most of my time working, um, and I still still row recreationally several times a week, and um, and, I, and I you know I run and, and bike uh, too. So that's sort of my life now. Um, but yeah, I think that um, you know Blair kind of. You know, like having these two um, two things, having rowing and work, is, it's uh, it's really important to me. It keeps me in balance. I feel like I can't do one without the other. Um, so I think that's that's sort of a, a set of values that I got here at Blair, and I'm pretty grateful for it. Speaking a lot easier, I can't see you. Oh, crap. <laughs> so, in any way, I hope you guys, some of you may have seen me around campus today. My name is Louis Cirillo. I was teaching AP Econ. I'm just kidding. Uh, I've graduated from Blair Academy in uh, 2008, and I'm the CEO of Virtual U Incorporated, which is a startup that we founded about eight months ago. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit if this will work. There we go. About my company, Virtual U. And for, I think I've made every girl's dream in here. We created a way for you guys to go online and shop for clothing and see it rendered on your body perfectly to get you the accurate fit. But you know how this really happened? Everybody always asks me, how did you, you get the idea? 
you know, you're not a fashion book, but I'm, I'm clearly not. I go around town in shorts, flip-flops, t-shirt, no name brands, it doesn't really matter to me. So how could I end up in the fashion industry? Well, one day I was having a philosophical discussion with some friends at a local Starbucks. You know, we were imagining J. Crew, Armani. No, I'm totally kidding. The skier bro here <laughs> came out and uh, decided, hey bro, I, I totally can't get the right size ski pants when I order online. Could you like make a phone app for that? And you're all probably thinking, oh man, well that's probably a brilliant idea. Could you do that? I was like, no man, that's totally stupid. Who would want to do that? So anyway, a couple of months later, I ended up starting the company. And here's how it works, really. People, as we all say, have your needs. You want to try clothes online. You want to confidently shop for clothing. And retailers want to decrease the returns. So we solved this problem. We built a system, an accurate 3D modeling unit that creates a digital avatar to yourself, an integrated website that allows you to see clothing on your virtual model. I know that you guys may not be as cut as that. <laughs> but, uh, Bear with me, we added a couple of really unique features that allow you to really see clothing in real time. So in about six months or so, you'll be able to visit a Gucci, Victoria's Secret, J. Crew, Joseph A. Bank, and try out our system. So you're going to step in, get yourself modeled, visit your web page, and try stuff on. It's actually pretty awesome. But, as you can guess, it was an incredibly difficult system to build. But really getting into it, tonight you guys brought us back to talk about our careers. And I always say, is entrepreneurship actually a career? Um, the last time I checked, if, if somebody could tell me the answer to this, when was the last time you saw Google uh, post a job for entrepreneur? I'll, I'll wait. No one? Okay, that's because there isn't a job for an entrepreneur. So you actually have to have a skill set. In my case, I am a programmer. I'm not going to say programmer, I am a programmer, which means I like to wear my uh, pink pop collar t-shirt, rage dubstep, just kidding. <laughs> but the real case of it is, if somebody out here, I want somebody to see you show of hands, who can tell me what an entrepreneur is? Anybody? Alright, there you go. Like someone who starts their own business and is like their own boss. <clears throat> there we go. You got it. So. The real key about this, what I'm going to talk to you tonight about, is some challenges about doing a startup, but more perfectly, how not to be a entrepreneur. People who sit there and talk about it, and the reason I say this is because many of you are going to go off to college, and you're going to go to college, and you're going to get there, and there's going to be this thing called an entrepreneurship club. And you're going to go in, and you're going to go, so, so who here has, your, has a company? No one. That's because the entrepreneurs are actually the ones in their office doing work. And so, it's kind of an excuse, but the thing is, I want to say, some of you, if you're interested in doing this field, you're going to come up and say, man, I have an idea, and what separates you is doing something about it, really getting in there, and just hitting it off and letting it go. So this is actually our team, we we're up at Distilled Intelligence, which is a uh, multinational competition, uh, Nick Graber, Blair alumni, on the right hand side, works with us as a product developer, which is pretty cool. So, anybody in here want to start a company or think it would be awesome? Uh, oh, that's more hands than I was expecting. Sweet. <laughs> High five to all of you. <laughs> so, we're going to get into some challenges of doing a startup. What I always say is getting serious. Building a team, creating a prototype, everybody's favorite part, finding money, and planning for the future. So, getting serious here. <laughs> <laughs> possibly, the, uh, possibly the first and most challenging part of every company is getting from idea to going, man, I should actually work at this. Like, I should actually sit here and come up with a couple of things. You know, you want to go pitch it. In our case, I was going, is it possible to even do this? So I sat down, I broke out my laptop, I was writing some code, I was ripping it mad hard, raging to dubstep. And at the end of it, you know, this entire rage master session, I ended up with nothing. I was kidding. I ended up writing a physics engine to prove that what we were doing was possible. So, the next thing that I always say is you need to build a team. And this is our Blair Academy, the seniors crew racing team that I was on. I'm actually, I'm probably the shortest one with the sunglasses. Yeah, that was me. Um, 
is building a team. And for those prospective entrepreneurs out there, one of the hardest challenges you have is you need to convince somebody to do your to do your job. You can't do anything on your own. I mean, there's uh, you know anything that you can do. You need people to work with you. You want them to work with you. Sometimes, at least what we called it, was the pizza and beer budget when you first start. I know you guys were in high school, so pizza, pop rocks. Um, I, I'm not sure what else. Maybe the ultra brotastic Starbucks Frappuccino. I'm not too sure. But there was one thing that really that I found out that was awesome about this. Somebody got up and said, when I was just starting the company, "Great, you're like every other startup, man. You got your your best friends together, and you're going to go take over the world." And I was like, I, I I looked down that condescending tone for a second, but I was like, "You got one thing right. I was going to take over the world." We're still getting there. So, the next thing was to build your solution. When I was starting off, I said I wanted to model some of the stuff to prove that we could actually scan some people. So these were sh screenshots and things that I did in the first month of our work. Proving that we could simulate the way cloth worked. Proving that we could digitally scan somebody's face with incredible accuracy. Our system is now fully operational and looks a little different, but this is where we started. Because the real challenge was, how do you make something that looks like, well, the Matrix? I mean, that's what everybody thinks when we tell our idea, like you're going to make them step into a movie or whatever it was. And as part of this, building a prototype, I say every entrepreneur needs a skill. And I said, well, mine was basket weaving. No, I'm just kidding. It's not. I'm, in fact, a programmer once again, through and through. So. The fourth step, find some money. Yeah, that is me holding a big pile of cash. It was awesome. And there's a couple of ways you can do this. And this is ultimately one of the most challenging things because everybody has a, uh, a connection to their company so you could sell product. You could go after investment money, which is what we did. It's fun and it's scary all at the same time. But ultimately, you know that cash flow is the cornerstone of any business, any successful business. So, in our case, I'll give you a brief process. You really want to do that here at Blair. You guys are all doing networking. And for a while, I was never really a big proponent of it, but stalking people on LinkedIn, arranging meetings. Has anybody ever seen the show, The Shark Tank? Yes. There we go. <laughs> Basically, I live this probably 24 hours a day. I end up pitching to somebody and then going, hey, that's your idea, and then we have to negotiate and set up terms and do your round, and it's very headache, but at the same time it's awesome because you get to finally sit down and run your business. And step five for me is always plan and grow your company. And the best part about growing your company is you need to have the vision to see your product, not where it is now, not where it is next year, but where it is in five years. And how can we take control of that and how can we grow? You want to find good talent which we have. We have a team right now of 12 developers and we're hiring eight more. Because we need a lot of talent to sit and crunch a lot of time on our project. But moreover, you need more than that. You need your retail partners. Like I said earlier, we're partnered with Gucci, Louis Vuitton, Victoria's Secret. We even have a guy from the executive board of Gucci who sits on our advisory board. So he legally helps us out. But that is the entire foundation. So a couple ideas on getting your company off the road. If you have an idea, start now. I don't really know many entrepreneurs who've gotten out there and just said, you know what, um, five years from now, I think might be a good time. Um, yeah, five years, one month, two days, and 35 seconds. That'll be the perfect time to do my startup. Nobody says that. I mean, people stumble onto their ideas, and the best thing you can do is get it started. You know, that means building a prototype, that means playing Bob the Builder, that means going whatever you need to do to get it done, you try. Because the best thing is, you guys are all in high school now, so I'm giving these words of advice to people <coughs> who have incredibly more time even than I did before you are tempted by the working world to do a startup or even to work for one. And that's my other part. If you're not the idea thinker of yourself, if you're not the innovator, but one of the best things you can do is work for a small company. I learned all the skills that I had for starting our company not from college. I learned them from working with a small company who let me in 
on every facet. I saw their development plans, how they grow, and everything of that nature, which led me to work here. And finally, you know, we're going to talk about Blair. I don't know how, how many of you out there like writing? Writing? Okay, we should see more hands in this because I can tell you what, writing is incredibly important. As is public speaking. I had told once I had to go onto a stage at that event that you saw earlier with, with Graver. I walked onto a stage in front of a hall about three times the size of this, a bunch of millionaires and billionaires there, and they gave me one minute, said, present your idea. And if they liked it, he brought you back. They cut out 30 people from 50 out of a top seven, out of 700 people in order to bring out that, the best couple of teams. Thankfully, we made it, which was awesome. And that's the end for me. If you guys have questions, we'll see you later. class of 2007. Uh, when I was at Blair, I was a four-year skier and a three-year rower. Um, I liked science. I took chemistry with Doc and took uh, two years of physics. And um, I was also a day student. And when I graduated from Blair, I moved on to Brown University, where I uh, did a lot of the same things. So when I was a senior at Blair, I took uh, economics, AP economics, and then when I went to Brown, I was a four-year skier. I majored in economics, and I really um, had a lot of great formative events that uh, I think really improved your development. Um, I studied abroad in Paris for a semester. Uh, I was in a responsible investing club that managed money on behalf of Brown. I, uh, you know, basically continued my development, but most importantly from a careers perspective, uh, college is the time that you start to get experience and it's when you start to build your network. So when I was in college, I had two internships. The first was uh, something that a friend had referred me to and they had worked there the previous summer and I worked at a firm that consults pensions on how to invest their money on behalf of teachers and state employees and uh, employees of big corporations like car manufacturers and that sort of thing, which helped me to get another internship working at City Group in the investment bank. So I guess the point that I would drive home is that, uh, you know, just like Lewis said, it's not hard, it's not, um, it's not too early to start to gain experience and everything really builds on itself and when you start to get out there and get experience, it can open up doors that you didn't know were there, which can be interesting. Um, so finance is really, especially investment banking, is all about being a middleman. So a perfect example would be if Lewis is an entrepreneur, he needs to raise money. And if Claire is an investor, she wants to make money on behalf of wealthy individuals, corporations, pension funds. And so somebody needs to be there to bring the two of them together. So investment banks really serve two functions. The first is helping companies to raise capital. So we'll go out on behalf of clients and we'll do a public stock listing, like for example, Facebook last year <coughs> sold stock to public companies to, or to public investors to raise money. We'll also help them sell debt. And what they do is is turn around and use that capital to grow their business. And then the second function we serve is as an advisor to companies. So for example, when one large company buys another large company, there's almost always a feeding frenzy of investment banks and lawyers who are there to bring the two together, to make sure the agreement doesn't fall apart, to make sure the terms are fair to both sides. And that's really the essence of investment banking, is being that middleman. Um, another example of a bank that is probably simpler and more likely <coughs> is it acts as an interface between savers and uh, spenders. So if you buy a house, 
your mortgage is funded by people's savings accounts and things of that nature. Um, I think finance and you know related career paths like consulting are important for people to know about as they enter into college because at top schools, um, finance and consulting are often employing more than a third of the graduates. So it's really uh, a, a path to a job, which not all college majors uh, give you skills that are directly translatable to a job. A lot of times it's more difficult, but if you are at a lot of schools, the finance you know, career path is almost the easiest path because there's a whole recruiting uh, you know, apparatus that comes to schools and actively searches out for candidates that I think is much harder to find in technology or special <coughs> entrepreneurship. Um, nobody's going to come to you and ask you and beg you to be an entrepreneur, but people will do that for finance. And so that's a, probably one of the reasons that it's very popular with um, graduates at top schools. Um, finance is really has a reputation of being a tough industry, uh, especially these days. Um, investment banking has the reputation of being the worst of the worst. So uh, for your first year, it can be uh, pretty miserable. Um, you know, you'll get no sympathy for being in the office at 2 a.m. I was in the office at 1 a.m. last night. That's just how the job works for your first few years, and often as long as 10 years, people can work you know, those kind of hours. It's um, a high-stress job because virtually everything you work on has a you know, tight deadline, and you have very uh, discerning clients. So typically, if we're um, doing analysis, it's for a CEO or a CFO or the board of directors of you know, the largest companies in the world. And basically what that all boils down to is a 24-7 culture and uh, you know, you're very accountable at all times. So it can be a tough career. It's also, I think, rewarding for people who genuinely enjoy it and they like being part of the action. It is a little bit fun to you know, read the front page of the Wall Street Journal and it's you know, the announcement for something you've been working on for nine months and that sort of thing. So, it's a career where I would say you, you, know, you have some tangible benefits and most importantly, uh, you really are, you develop a skill set whether you like it or not. And every business in the world has a finance function. Somebody's working on the finances. And so the skills that you learn in investment banking or in consulting or working for an investment fund are very, very transferable. And so, as a career path, you have a lot of different uh, avenues to explore. So on a day-to-day -day basis, what an investment banking analyst does, um, a startup is a great example. What we'll do is we'll create a financial model for the company. So we'll figure out how much are they going to sell in each year, how much uh, profit will they make on those sales, and then we'll model out how much are they paying, like their overhead, and basically come out with a forecast of how much cash they're going to have over the next few years. And we'll use that to uh, decide what we think the value of the company is. For example, if Lewis wanted to sell his company to a big, like, Google, you know, we would tell them, we think that based on what they've paid in the past and based on the value of the cash you're going to earn, you know, your company could be worth X. And then, Basically, the analyst's job at the junior level is turning all of that analysis into a concise presentation because ultimately it's going to go to uh, an individual who has very little time to consider it. And so that kind of presentation might go to the head of Google. He'll look at it for five minutes and tell his team, yeah, we'll buy his company, and then they'll go and execute the transaction and we'll help them do all of the uh, the accounting and the agreements between the companies and all of that. Um, the, a, a question that's commonly asked, not from high schoolers, but in college people start to think about it, is how do you break into finance? It's very, uh, it's very difficult. There are probably a thousand investment banking analysts every year. So it's 
uh, basically a system where it's difficult to get a job. And so my best advice would be, um, first of all, you're, you're lucky to have the resources um, and the internet has opened new possibilities for learning about finance that didn't exist even 10 years ago. So what I mean by that is you can log on today and read investment pitches for companies. Uh, for example, there's a company called Herbalife, a major hedge fund bet $1 billion against their stock, put up a presentation on the internet. Another company bet it $350 million the other way. They're supporting the stock, and they have made public statements. And then there are other investors making public statements. So if you are really interested in the subject, um, the resources online for you to read, there's no, there's no barrier for you to start learning now. And the sooner you start to get involved, the better you set yourself up for something like an internship position um, when you're maybe after your sophomore year in college, which is really, I would say, the entry to the whole system. Um, and the other thing that I would suggest is, um, you know, finance and investing can be very social, so you can talk to your friends about it. And um, I think there was an investing club when I was here, but um, that kind of thing can be enjoyable. For example, when things are very high profile, like Facebook, you could see every day arguments in the papers. It's overvalued. It's undervalued. The bankers are cheating them. You know. The public's getting a great deal, and being a part of that conversation is really how you learn about it. So, um, happy to answer any questions people have after the program, and uh, thank you all. Hi, <laughs> my name is Molly Matthew. I'm in class of 05. Um, oh, it's amazing to be here. I'm so happy to be here. Um, are there any Blair Academy singers in the crowd? Okay, how about Blair Academy players? Okay, awesome. Well, I was both of those things and loved being those things and took great pride in, in being those things and um, I'm still doing those things in my life today. Uh, I came to Blair as a sophomore also and had loved theater my whole life and loved singing my whole life and didn't... I, I can't remember when the moment was that I, that I thought I would try to do it for my life, but I know it happened when I was at Blair um, because of the amazing resources over at the theater and the incredible shows that I got to do. I got to play roles that I don't think I would ever be cast in, in my life, and I got to stretch myself and learn so much about what I love to make as an actor and a performer and find confidence in that. And uh, after my junior year here, I spent the summer living in New York City studying at a musical theater program and knew immediately that I wanted to be in New York for the rest of my life, perhaps, uh, or at least for college. So I came back to Blair. I ended up quitting lacrosse that year and doing all three of the shows and applied early to NYU and got in and ended up going to NYU to study musical theater, uh, which was very hard um, when I got there. I, I was a very tiny fish in a very big pond with lots of big fish. I, see, I felt like I was the only tiny fish. And um, my freshman class at NYU were 20 people over the amount that they usually accept because no one said no. Everyone decided to come that freshman year to NYU to study musical theater, so we were uh, in dance studios taking jazz dance class, getting punched in the yeah. face because there was so little room in the, in the studios because there were so many of us. And uh, I really struggled uh, in that environment um, in my first few years of college, and I made the decision to transfer out of the musical theater program into the experimental theater program, which essentially means I learned how to make theater from nothing, how to write and direct and act with, I could take this and I could make a 10 minute play about this if I wanted to. And I hopefully could make it interesting and make you guys interested in it. And um, I learned there that 
I wanted to be a part of making theater from the ground up, not just uh, being cast in, in anything and taking any job, although I do do that as well. <laughs> um, I, when I was at ETW, which is the Experimental Theater Wing at NYU, I met an amazing playwright and director and theater maker whose name is Moises Kaufman. He's directing a play on Broadway right now, actually, called The Heiress, and he, uh, he came, he was an alum of that program, and he came back and directed a show with 16 of us. We, we created the show ourselves, taken from personal experiences, text that we wrote, that we gathered, and um, that was a huge, huge learning experience for me, and he is still a colleague and friend and collaborator of mine in, in New York, and he's a person whose work I used to read, who I never thought I would meet, let alone work with and call a friend, and that has been crazy. <laughs> so, I, uh, I graduated a semester early from NYU after spending a summer abroad studying experimental theater in Amsterdam. And I, uh, I was out in the real world in January when all of my classmates were still in school until May, and that was scary and uh, very hard, but I, I took a lesson I learned at Blair, which I think we all do learn it, I don't know how much we all are aware of it, but the, the great independence that we have as students here and the responsibility that we must take over our lives, because my mom and dad who are here tonight weren't here to wake me up in the morning and make sure I got to class. I had to do that myself or someone would come knocking on my door. <laughs> so I learned, I learned that I had to look out for myself and be responsible and take care of myself if I wanted to be a successful, important part of this community. And I did want to be that. And I tried to do that. And I've taken that into my life in New York because there could be some mornings when I don't have something to do to get out of bed for. And uh, those days are, are not good days. They are sad days. I want the things to do. So I get myself out of bed and I go and I find something creative to do. I find uh, an audition to go to, or I gather friends of mine who are theater makers and start rehearsing a new play because I can, and because I want, that's what I want to be doing. So, uh, after I graduated, I struggled for a few months, just knowing and not knowing how to function in the real world and in New York City and without structure, which I had had so much of for so long, especially having been here at Blair. But I got a job. I did a musical in Wisconsin, which was a, a great learning experience. Not, not many people in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin come in to see musicals, but they came, those of them who were there and wanted to, and I got to do that and start to learn what it's like to be a professional actor. Um, and since then, I've gotten to do a lot of really amazing things that uh, still surprise me uh, today. I spent the last two summers working at a theater festival in Massachusetts called the Williamstown Theater Festival, which is an amazing place where essentially people from New York, Broadway actors, directors, and um, theater makers come up for, for the summer to the Berkshire Mountains and make the same quality work that they make in New York, but on a little vacation in the beautiful Berkshire Mountains. And um, having spent two summers there, my entire life has been changed from that. I've since I've gotten a lot of amazing jobs working in the theater in New York, and I've performed at the Sydney Opera House in Sydney, Australia. I've worked with playwrights and composers and musicians that I really, truly never thought I would meet, <laughs> let alone work with, and um, that has been amazing. And also, I, uh, I sing in a band. I started a band with two of my best friends from college. We're called Miko and the Musket. And you can download our record on iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> and we're playing at Alumni Day on May 11th, so I'll see you all there. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, I, this was, uh, my friends and I would, you know, we're kind of nerdy music people, and we just sit around and sing harmonies together and, and you know, nerdy, have fun, playing guitar, singing. And, about four months later, we had six original songs that we had written ourselves, two, two guys and I, singing three-part harmony. And we started playing at rock clubs and venues in New York and had a great reaction and 
we're loving doing it. So we built a bigger band. We're now a seven-piece band. We've played all over the northeastern U.S. We're, our first record is available on iTunes. We're currently recording our second one. Um, we won a really cool big award in Philadelphia at the World Cafe Live. We were the best band of the year of two excuse me, 2011, which was very exciting. And, um, oh gosh, I hope I'm saying everything I wanted to. It, it's, it's really hard doing what I do, but the, the, how much I love it and how much it fills me as a functioning, working, hopefully smart and nice human being uh, is, is why I do it. it. It fills me so much and um, I, I have a long way to go. Um, I'm not sure there is ever a, a, an end to, in the career path that I've chosen, but I don't intend to stop um, anytime soon. And the, the fun part of it is the always going, finding the next project, finding the next thing to fill me and excite me. And, um, and I'm, I'm about to start a show off Broadway in New York in February, and then I'm going back to Australia to do another show in March. And I'm getting to see the world, which is amazing. And uh, yeah. <laughs> now I'm here, back at Blair, talking to you guys. Oh, it's crazy. <laughs> so that's, that's all, I think, probably. Great, thank you.